I'm really, really happy and honored that we have some, we have many guests actually here today uh, and some things like that. Uh, we have an amazing family that are very close and very dear to my heart, um, have been very involved in my life, uh, gosh, 12 years now, th 12, 13, almost, I guess we met 13 years ago, but really got close from t the last 12 years we've been I've seen them um, many times more than I saw my own family in a, in a particular year, so they kind of became my family. Uh, so in the back we have uh, Q Day. Um, he spoke many, you know, many times before, and we have Noah sitting next to him, all grown up. So I, you know, the first time I met him, he was like three, four years, four years old, and now you know, he's like a man. So <laughs> I guess that just means I'm getting old, but it's really great. Um, but when I was in Wales last time, and I heard that they were coming, I, I said, oh, it'd just be nice if you could come. And Q-Day said, oh, it'd be great if Bridget can speak. And Bridget wasn't in the room at the time. <laughs> and then she came by and was like, would you? And she's like, what? And we're like, hey, when you come to, come to Seoul, can you come to Crossway? And she said, yes, absolutely. Because whenever you can get a well-qualified woman of God which means she deeply loves the Lord and seeks after God with all of her heart. I think it's really great to be able to have her share whatever the Lord's put on her heart. Um, so Bridget uh, has been a missionary uh, for a very long time. Uh, she's an amazing. She rebelled against her parents in the sense that uh, she followed Jesus and went after Jesus and uh, then met Q-Day, which is a miracle upon all miracles. Um, and they got married uh, later in life, which gives hope to all of us uh, who are still waiting. And uh, then God blessed them with two uh, children, you know, and, and things. And we know, especially this day and age, what a blessing that is to be able to have children. Um, and so uh, I just, a few things about Bridget. She is an amazing woman who has opened up her home of hospitality to the stranger and to friend, and she welcomes everybody at her table. Um, she has a heart to teach and disciple. Um, she's taught many Koreans how to make bread to their waist, um, shame of their waistline. Uh, you don't go to their house and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a proper home. And um, they just, they... Together, I don't know, how much are you going to share about Forge? Or Not much, okay. So uh, it, it started some time ago in Wales. I won't get into the whole heart of it, but it's a ministry that was raising up the spiritual blacksmiths, and it takes place in a time in which uh, Israel wasn't allowed to have any blacksmiths because the Philistines ruled that area. And so if they wanted to get their plows sharpened or something, they had to go to a Philistine town. And we began to realize that in this day and age, many people don't sharpen, don't know how to sharpen their own spiritual tools. So it became a ministry that was focused on growing in intimacy with the Lord, the Word of God, meditation, worship, community, genuine community, as well as outreach and an expression of outreach. And they do that in their everyday life. Like every day, that's what they're doing. Every day, they're impacting their community. Every day, they're being a light to a place um, that is almost, you know, in some regards, forgotten in just neighborhoods and people's lives. And they made a home for me when I was just in a place of needing long-term companionship for the promises that God had on my life. And so they've encouraged me to be able to be sustained as a missionary for those years that I didn't have any home and then in my in just the the years of being a tourist visa in Korea for 11 years. And so when I wasn't here I went to their home oftentimes and that's where I ended up going. And so I'm really grateful that she's able to come and just share her heart and what the Lord has put in her heart and her family with us and their precious time. You haven't been to Korea for five years? Five years now um, was the last time that they were all in Korea together. So uh, thank you so much. So I want to invite you, Bridget, to come forward. And I just want to pray for you and bless you. 
So, Lord, I thank you that you have hidden your words in her heart, your treasures in her soul. I thank you, Lord, for her love and her passion of seeking you out and just being a, a friend of yours and a lover of yours and wanting to share that, that zeal with others. I pray that you would just anoint her to encourage us all with that which she comes to share. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So feel free to move that as you need. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's really nice to be here. Um, and I don't get many invitations to speak to groups. Uh, it's not something I do much of. My husband's the preacher. So um, I'm really just going to share. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, uh, and I am so low-tech that I actually have a notebook <laughs> that I wrote in with a pen. Can you believe that? I do have my Bible on a phone, though. Uh, I just better switch that on. Okay. Okay, so the, the things that God put on my heart to share, um, and, uh, and we have a, a mutual friend to blame for this, um, Adam Coates. <laughs> um, He's kind of a sports coach. Now, I don't look like someone who uses a sports coach, but I, I do his stretch class twice a week, um, and he shares what God's put on his heart, and it inspired me. Um, and so I've been meditating on that for a couple of weeks now from 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read the verse. Uh, you guys use ESV, yeah? Let me find that. You can have so many Bibles on your phone now. It's just bewildering. 2 Corinthians 3. Just going to read verse 18. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. Other translations say, from glory to glory. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay, <clears throat> so, restoring God's image. Um, as Ian was sharing, and thank you for the leading us in worship, that was really lovely. And uh, the things that you shared really resonate with what I was meditating on. God created us each of us, uniquely, uh, beautifully. And every one of us is a unique reflection of God into the world. Um, only you can reflect God into this world in your way. Nobody else can do that. And that's how God created us, to be little tiny reflections of him in the world. Um, and then that image was spoiled. And we know, we know this. We, we sinned. We were disconnected. The image that God wanted to reflect into the world of himself through us has been spoiled. And we're in the world kind of echoing an image of God, but not reflecting God. Human beings can reflect something of God, but they often reflect something very different. Uh, and the overall image is often not very beautiful. And that was God's whole purpose in, in Jesus' coming, was to restore that image. He wants us to reflect that image into the world. And he wants us to reflect our own unique reflection of him into the world. Because he doesn't want it to be lost. He wants you, your unique reflection of God, to be forever. He doesn't want it to be lost. And, yeah, he doesn't... <clears throat> he doesn't want us to be so... Um, oh, I need... Jesus in me, more of Jesus, less of me. My husband wrote a song called that. 
more of you and less of me, so that I diminish and get less and less and just disappear altogether and all that's left is Jesus. That's not actually what God wants. He wants me to exist. He wants my, my uniqueness to be there forever. And your uniqueness, the way you are. Um, yeah, there's more on that later. So, as this verse says, um, and in, in another translation that I looked at, it makes it even clearer. It says, we behold the glory of the Lord in a mirror and we are changed into that image. So when I look in the mirror, I have to say, I don't always see Jesus. <laughs> I see me. Um, but because I'm created in the image of God, it's also worth looking at myself sometimes. Um, and so I, uh, I have yeah, had a few little thoughts about this, about when I look in the mirror, I see myself as an image of Jesus. I see what makes up me. Now, I know in Korea, everybody's uh, all familiar with your personality profiles, yeah? Who knows their personality profile? Yeah. <laughs> I'm an ENFP, <laughs> just so as you know. Our family, we, we like these, especially me and Noah. We like these personality profiles. During the lockdown in the Wales, we spent a week uh, each day, one person from the family, we analyzed their personality and we all read about it. It was a really useful exercise. So when I look at my character, um, I can see things that I uh, bring, things that I can give, things that I'm good at. I'm good at being enthusiastic. I'm good at teamwork. I'm willing to step up and do stuff. I have lots of ideas. I can also see things I am not good at. Um, I'm not consistent. I'm not very reliable. I'm not realistic. I'm not good at detail, logistics, or decisiveness. You can see how I could be an annoying person on a team also. And that gives me a lot of appreciation for people who are not like me, who can do those things, because I need them. I can also recognize, and it's really important to do this, to recognize what I need. Because uh, needs are, they exist, and they are just that. They are what we actually need. Um, and they're literally what we need to flourish. I don't know if everybody knows the word flourish. It's a bit unusual. Um, flourish is what a plant does when it's got just the right kind of soil and the right amount of light and water. It grows and it flowers. And if it doesn't have those things, it won't do quite so well. And it's good to know what you need to flourish. Some personalities need to achieve and succeed. They actually need to be able to do that. Some, like me, don't necessarily need to achieve, but we need to be connected with everybody uh, and have lots of interaction. Some personalities actually need a lot of space. They need to be left alone and not pestered all the time and have to interact all the time. Some personalities like a lot of variety. Some like things to be predictable. Um, some like adventure, and some need to feel safe. And some like to be really organized and know that things are clear. And if you know what your needs are, uh, then you can recognize when you are in a position where they're not being met and you're not going to flourish, it's then really important where we're focusing in the mirror. Because 
if my focus becomes getting my needs met, I won't, won't be at peace in Jesus. I'm not always going to get my needs met. It's not everybody else's responsibility to meet my needs or to create situations where I feel that my needs are being met. It's not. If my needs are not being met and I'm not flourishing, I can go two ways. I can become demanding. You know, you people, you're not giving me enough whatever, community. You're not giving me enough affirmation. You're not giving me enough uh, room. Or I can withdraw because I feel like I'm failing. I condemn myself. I become fearful and I'm ineffective. But if I focus on Jesus, Jesus knows what I need. And he knows I'm not always going to have it all. If I focus on Jesus, I can be in peace. Jesus can give me what I need now. And the things that I might need that I'm not getting yet, he knows and he can provide that for me. And it stops me from demanding from other people and it stops me from condemning myself. That's why those things are important. So, I had a verse here that I've skipped. John. Where's John? There he is. 3.30. This verse, spoken by John the Baptist, we named our second son after John the Baptist, Sere Johan. <laughs> and he is indeed a voice that cries out. Not always for Jesus yet, but we have faith. And so John the Baptist, he's talking about, about himself and Jesus. He must increase and I must decrease. And I have heard that verse spoken and, and used to mean that I must get smaller and smaller and smaller and disappear until just Jesus is there. Um, and I think that's a wrong interpretation. You know, the, the Buddhists have as their ultimate aim to disappear. You know that better than I do uh, in this country. They have as their aim to be disappeared, vanish, to not be there anymore. That's not our ultimate aim. And sometimes, yes, we need to decrease so that Jesus can increase in us. Our focus on ourselves needs to decrease so that we can have more of Jesus. But we are not meant to just disappear. We're meant to be here doing our thing that only we can do. That brings him glory. When I do what Jesus made me to do, it brings him glory. And that's the ultimate aim at the... Uh, there's a tendency, maybe it's just my personality type, to want people to see me well and to be impressed with what I can do. Um, that's not the right focus. The right focus is for people to see what Jesus can do. And it's the process of being transformed by looking in that mirror Sorry, switching between translations. We all, with unveiled faces, with unveiled faces. So who has, who has the veiled face? Paul talks about two different kinds of people who have the veiled face. And we are the ones with the unveiled face. The first ones with a veil are just a few verses earlier. Uh, verse 15. To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Uh, he's talking about the religious veil um, because Paul was a very religious Jew before he met Jesus. He knows this from the inside, 
the, the religious Jews studied the scriptures. They really did. They debated them. They sought to understand every detail um, and perform it faithfully. And there's a fine line between seeking faithfully to obey God and seeking really hard to get everything right. Because that focuses on our performance, on what we can do, on um, looking at ourselves and judging ourselves and comparing ourselves to other people who may not be getting it quite right or who may be doing better than we are. Um, and this is not something that's exclusive to the Jews. We do this. We do this. We need to look inside and see where we are doing this. We had unveiled faces. Are we being veiled again by this religious veil when we take our focus off Jesus and we look at our performance? Are we getting it right? When I was in university, uh, there was a good group of Christians there, young Christians, and most of them were from a very evangelical background. You may not know that distinction in the, in the British church, but they are very keen on understanding the Bible and not being deceived and not that fond of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then the other half of the Christian group were like me. We were happy, clappy, you know, house church um, people. And there was a lot of discussion and focus on not being deceived because we know the scriptures. But it really troubled me that these people knew that the scriptures said this, and these people knew that the scriptures said that, and these people over here knew that the scriptures said something else. And how would I, with no theological training, be able to work out for myself exactly what the scriptures said about, I don't know, whether you should eat pork or not, uh, whether you should pray in tongues or not, um, yeah, whether you should lay hands on people to pray for them or not. I, how could I work it out? And it worried me because I thought that you had to. And I realized some years later that the way to know is through revelation by the Holy Spirit. Like, I will never understand exactly the interpretation that you're meant to get from all of Scripture. I will know, because the Holy Spirit speaks to me, what he wants from me at any given moment. And it's such a relief. Because, you know, I might get it wrong, and it's okay. I might not get everything right or understand everything all at once. Um, and it's okay. And actually, trying to understand everything right and do everything right leads you to being deceived. It can put that veil over your eyes so you can't see Jesus properly. There's another veil. Uh, a few verses further down. No, that's not where I wanted to go. In chapter 4, verse 4. He's talking about those to whom the gospel is veiled because they are unbelievers. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. There is a veil that those who don't know Jesus at all have that the God of this age, the God of this world, holds in front of them so they can't see. And I was thinking, what is that? What's the God of this age? What's the veil he's using in this age? And there's probably more than one, but the one I see around me so much, even more in Korea than at home, is the veil of image and appearance. You walk around in Seoul and everywhere around you the perfect Korean girl face, the perfect Korean boy body is there. This is how you should be. This is how you should look. Come and take these supplements. Come to this gym. Come to this plastic surgeon. Um, and people run after these things. Korea is famous for plastic surgery. It really is. I have a Chinese friend, a good friend, home in, at home in Wales, 
I told her we were coming to Korea. She's like, oh, you're going to have surgery. And I said, no. <laughs> I think she thinks I ought to, because I'm getting a bit old now. I could do with, you know, a bit of a lift here. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to. Um, but that's one thing that people think of. You know, everybody wants this perfect face. Um, and it, it matters to them. And, it, and trying to get that, you will never achieve it. That's not all we're supposed to run after. We're supposed to look like us, not like the girl on the poster. God wants us to look like us. Different, unique. And, you know, you add to that the clothes, the makeup, the advertising, the K-pop stars, the dramas, the sports stars. It's all a veil that stops people from seeing, and it can stop us from seeing. It's very easy for us to look at that, too. It's easy for us to uh, allow the veil of um, living in some kind of fantasy world. So many young people, I'm sure, here as well, spend their lives. I'm not talking about a little bit of um, uh, leisure time gaming. I'm talking about living in the internet in a fantasy world so that you don't have to relate to people in the real world where they might see what you're really like. There's, that's a veil. People hide there and they can't see. And there's all sorts of nasty stuff in the internet that will blind people's eyes. Is that affecting us? Are we allowing? We who had the unveiled faces, are we allowing ourselves to be veiled? It's so easy just to shift your focus from Jesus, just to allow your mind to be filled with something else. But we are the ones with unveiled faces. We can look at Jesus and see his glory. Oh, I can't find it. There we are. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts. God spoke into the void, let there be light. The whole universe comes from that, that word, let there be light. That same voice spoke into our hearts, let there be light. Let the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus shine in our hearts. It unveils our faces. We can see reality. Reality is in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Reality is not the, what they portray on the screens. That's just for entertainment. Real reality is not even what we can only see with our human eyes. Real reality is what God shines in our hearts, in the knowledge of the glory, in the face of Jesus. I wish I could see his face really, fully, but I, can, I have this promise. I can see the face of Jesus in my spiritual eyes. And I have to learn how to focus on that. It's there for me. It's given to me. God spoke it. If I'm not experiencing it right now, it's not because I'm falling short or failing or not good enough. It's just I haven't learned yet to live in the fullness of the reality. The reality is there. God has done it. Uh, this is what, what Adam always says, the coach. He says, we're just learning to walk in what Jesus has already done. We're not trying to achieve it. He's done it. God has done it. It's unveiled. We can see. But we sometimes need to learn how to walk in it, how to take hold of it in this here and now, every day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went the other day to see um, Inside Out 2, 
Who's seen it? Okay, so, so sorry if this is a spoiler. <laughs> Um, I really liked it. I really liked... Have you seen Inside Out 1? Anybody not seen either of them? You won't know what I'm talking about. Go see them. <laughs> They're really good. They give a really good visualization of what happens inside a person, uh, this particular person who's growing up and developing. And, yeah, they, I really liked the way they visualized her what were becoming her core beliefs about herself, her sense of self, and how that so easily got changed to core beliefs that were destructive. The particular one, sorry for the spoiler, <laughs> I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. How many of us have that core belief? These things are planted in us when we're young and they're strong. And with, even if we don't know they're there, they affect what we do, they affect how we think. I'm not good enough. I have to keep trying harder. I failed again, I'm not good enough. I have to try harder. And, it, and I have lived with that, unrecognized inside me. It must be because I'm not trying hard enough. And no, it's not. It's because I'm not receiving what Jesus has already done, because I'm not recognizing my own personalities, weaknesses, and limits. I have limits. I can't do everything. I can't be my husband who faithfully every morning at 5 a.m. is meditating on the scriptures. He really is. <laughs> Maybe Shabbat, he sleeps a bit longer. But he, any time you poke him, he can come out with what God is, is speaking to him. And I'm not like that. And it's not because I need to try harder. All of that richness is there for me also. I need to learn how to take hold of it. The relationship my husband has with Jesus is available for me. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to force myself to get up earlier every morning. I have to take hold of it. It's there. It's there. But maybe for me it won't look the same as it looks for him because I am different. So I don't know what your, um, how much of that fullness from Jesus you have yet taken hold of, but there is more. There is more. And he's not waiting for you to become harder working or more rigid or try harder in order to get it. He's waiting for you to focus on Jesus. Jesus has done it all. Jesus loves me. And anything that comes to me and says, Jesus doesn't love you quite that much yet, it's a lie. The enemy lies. It is not true. We have core beliefs, maybe, that are not true, and they're affecting us. And Jesus can deal with that as well. We don't have to beat ourselves up. Oh, no, I'm believing the wrong things. It's, I'm a failure. He is leading us into more and more fullness. We are beholding with unveiled faces in a mirror the glory of God. And we are being changed from glory to glory, to more of his image. It really is happening. Yeah. So, that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. Uh, can I pray for you? Yeah, I'd like to pray for you. Um, and if there's anything that particularly resonated for you, uh, particularly the, I'm not good enough, I must try harder, then let's break that. Let's get rid of it. Let's throw it out because it's a lie. You are completely accepted. God has spoken into your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. 
You're here because you know Jesus and you love Jesus, however imperfectly you might feel you do that. He's done it. Let's throw off what hinders us. Let's look at him and know that we are being changed to reflect his image in our own unique way. Okay. Father God, Father God, I praise you. There's so much that we could share. We'll never come to the end of understanding your amazing word, your amazing gospel, your salvation. Lord, so much that you have done for us and given us, even the little bit that we understand now. I just want to bless every person that's here, every individual in this fellowship now. I bless each one. Father, I praise you that you have lifted the veil, that you have spoken into their heart, that your light has shone, reflecting the glory of God in the face of Jesus in each one. Lord, that each one is unique and able to reflect you uniquely into the world. And wherever there's a lie of the enemy that's holding them down or holding them back or condemning them, we speak against it in the name of Jesus now. We just pray. Lord God, let your power come. Let your light shine again, Lord. Let us perceive where the enemy lies and throw it out. Let us open our arms to just receive more of what you have done for us, Jesus. Open the eyes of our heart now to see you, to see you, your face, your glory that shines on us, Lord, your smile as you look on us. We want to reflect your glory, Jesus. Amen. That was a really nice message. Thank you, Bridge. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, we're just surrounded. I was thinking, um, like, how many lies and voices are surrounding us every single day? Um, we want to focus on God, and we want to focus on what He tells us. Tells me. I am, but there are so many lies and different voices every day. We're just surrounded in them. And like it's a default, how easily we, we go for those lies. We just go to those lies and forget about what God tells me about me. So seeing his face uh, gazing our eyes upon his face means to me I get to believe what he says I am again. Amen. So maybe about yourself, there are many things you feel every day. Uh, there are many friends or even your family uh, members tell you about yourself. Um, but on the top of every voice and resource you have, uh, maybe we need to, right now, this moment, uh, listen to God and gaze upon his, his face and believe what he says I am, which matters the most. And it is so true that when we are satisfied in him, he is glorified. There's no point he hates and doesn't like what he created. He created us, each one of us, in such a beautiful and wonderful way, and we need to believe that. So our worship is to acknowledge it. As we sing this song again, let's make this happen in our hearts right now. You can sing together, or you can pray. When the music fades, all is stripped away, 
And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's a worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within from the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing One of the things that really stood out for me while Bridget was sharing today is this notion how we can veil ourselves through the comparison of one another. And it's, it's so easy that it'd be like, well, I'm not, you know, I, I, I can't sing as, as well as Ian or, or Paul. I can't you know, stand up in front of a large group like Matthew, or I can't teach as well as some, you know, like we could, we can just veil ourselves so much. But we're a community. And one of the things that I love about the community that we have in Wales, oftentimes just sitting in a living room, it's not, uh, you know, kyu demo ksanim, o samonim. You know, it's just Matthew and Kude and Bridget and each one brings who you are in the Lord 
and shares who you are with the group that we might see Jesus through you. So if you're not a teacher, you never have to teach. If you're not a cook, there's somebody has to clean the dishes. Everybody has to clean a toilet. Every Shabbat Friday night, we get together and we clean the whole house together. You know, people don't sit for hours and hours and hours talking like I do with people. I just have a gift of talk. But that's what God, like, really stirred because even before I became the pastor here, I was with Day and Bridget and we were in Wales and we were praying. And the question was, can we bring this community style heart to a church? And so she brought this heart of this very important message that I, I don't want you to lose. And that is this, we need you to be you. Each and every one of you is so important. Because I learn about Jesus through who you are. I see Jesus through who you are. And so I just want to keep encouraging you to, to realize that you have a place here because you are a reflection of Jesus that, that makes us more complete. Amen? So I'm really grateful. Um, Kyude and Bridget and their boys, they're going to stay with some guests um, we're going to have an extended fellowship time today, and we're going to order some food and, and things, and we'll just everyone can order food or we can order a big group order, whatever we decide um, when we get upstairs. But I want to invite everybody who would like to stay to, to have time to just keep talking with one another and sharing with one another and eating with one another, that we're going to continue that on the third floor um, here. But before that, I just want to bless you. I want to bless. Would you stand? May the Lord God bless you. Bring you into intimacy and relationship with him. May the Lord keep you, make you feel secure dwelling within his strong tower. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May his, his light, his glory, his beauty, his honor, his mercy, his goodness come upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you, his hospitality to you. May he bring you to his own table. And may you see as you look into the face of the Lord and the Lord stares back in your face that he smiles. And I bless you with the peace above all peace. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, be blessed. Amen. amen and amen. Have an amazing week, everybody. Continue to be a blessing as you are a blessing. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah.